right, and then I'll hand it over to Mr. Glenn Capelli. Thank you very much, Glenn. Yeah. Oh, thank you, indeed. And, and uh, wonderful for you all to join us and um, as part of the, the team doing some ongoing learning. Um, the theme that I wanted to look at was the we have a magic brain and in this crazy world of ours, how we can use it for thinking. And I guess the crazy world becomes even crazier in the last few months. So uh, wonderful to join us. So on behalf of the elders who have made me who I am and on behalf of the elders who have made you, who you are, and behalf of the elders who have walked this land of Denmark and wherever you may be, way before we came here. We'd like to honour them, and indeed I honour the Noongar folk in particular of this particular region. Not only um, created some great learning for us, but created some great footballers over the years too. So, uh, <laughs> double bonus. So, beautiful to be in Denmark, my first presentation from Denmark. and. I, as some of you will know, my favourite language on the planet looks like this. So three movements of the hands to the side of the body and the head is Auslan, Australian signing for our deaf community. Now, I am deaf in all upper registers and always have been. I, there's certain sounds I can never hear and never do hear. Joni Mitchell sounds really strange to me. She, her voice is really high, so I, I miss a lot of it. But uh, but that's not why I love signing. I love signing because I think when we learn with our bodies, we embody the learning. And it's been in schools and in organisations now, we teach people to learn with the body and bring your body and bring your emotion to it. My signing teacher, Carol Chittleborough, said that with signing, you cannot be shy. You have to be it. I mean, when uh, us hearing speaking people, we may say the word joy, oh, I'm full of joy but there's nothing in our voice and our body that shows joy. When you sign joy, you have to be joy. You have to look joy. So I'm going to invite you to be bringing your body and your emotion along to this learning because I want to teach a variety of vocabulary in signing that I think help us all deal with life, help us step through life, learn through life, uh, think our way through life. And I'd like to start with this. If you can take your finger, please, and raise it in the air and run it down your body. So like in every language, there's many ways to say a word, but this is the word for I. And you can say I in a variety of forms in signing, but the I, and then you pick an apple and pull it to your chest. This is the word for have. I have. And then you throw your fingers off your hand like abracadabra. And this is one of the many ways you can say magic. And then you put your hands on your head. And my signing teacher, Carol Chittleborough, said this is one of the many ways you can say the word brain. So let's run it all together slowly at first. I have a magic brain. And then we do it. I have a magic brain. And then with a live audience, and I'd say to you guys, so you point to somebody else and say, you have a magic brain. And they do, they say you have, but in every audience in Australia, apart from this one, there is somebody who always turns to the person next to them and says, you have no brain. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they think that's funny and amusing. But if you're in Germany, it's a statute law in Germany that if you insult another person's intelligence, if you say to somebody, you're dumb, you think you're silly, you're stupid, even if you went like this at them, the old sign for you're crazy, um, that you could be fined the equivalent of 75 Australian dollars. I mean, if this was a law in Australia, we would not need GST. We would have so much <laughs> money, you know? But we do have this magic brain. And I say to youngsters, this magic brain of ours, is chock-a-block full of crayons and every crayon is a talent and you don't just have one or two talents one or two crayons you've got a whole box load of crayons you've got hundreds of crayons now some of these crayons we discover late in life conrad ferdinand mayer had never written a poem until he was 51 became the national poet of switzerland you know people uh, elizabeth jolly western australia's own was very late in life before she published you know, there's things to discover ongoing in life. In fact, Robert Greenleaf said your first 60 years on the planet are just to find out what you really want to do. 
then spend your rest of your life doing them, exploring these crayons. Now, my belief is that sometimes crayons get damaged. Sometimes crayons need to be sharpened. So, so all crayons can be sharpened, but some people have some damaged crayons. My wonderful brother Gary is a brilliant, brilliant person, but his crayons for reading and writing don't quite work the way other people's do. So Richard Branson, who I interviewed on stage for 90 minutes, Richard doesn't like to do a speech because of his dyslexia. So he likes to be interviewed. So that some folk have damaged crayons and they use other crayons beautifully. So we can sharpen the crayons, we can use other crayons and it's a lifetime of exploration. So the song that goes with this, the two songs that go with this, see if we can get them working for you. And the first one. My magic brain delivers me the best. My magic brain. And then we wrote this one. There are a host of crayons and colours inside of you and me. Tamara Johnson was 12 years of age when she recorded the song. There's a host of crayons and colours inside of you and me. When we believe in our magic, we can set the colours free. We are born with a million crayons, talents with which to amaze. When we perceive it, start to believe it, beauty comes in every day. When we perceive it, start to believe it, beauty comes in every day. So my job as an educator is to unearth the crayons that are inside us all. Every youngster in front of us has got a bucket load of crayons and talents to be able to utilise. I do have a, a colleague who at some stage said to me, um, you know, with these, these crayons of ours, um, isn't it fine to use that as a metaphor for youngsters, but you wouldn't want to be using it with the corporate world, would you? And I, I have a belief that even corporate people are human beings, you know? Uh, so uh, I, I went into an organisation that I'd been doing some ongoing work for and I hadn't been there for a number of months and I was walking through their main office and the first chap who saw me said, hey, it's the crayon man. And then the next uh, person uh, held up a box of crayons. Got, I got my crayons and I'm using them. And the CEO said, ah, crayon bloke, come on in. So human beings are human beings, no matter what our age uh, if it makes sense to us, then we will own it. And the crayon metaphor, I think, just makes so much sense. So what are the crayons that we're not utilising? Instead of looking at a youngster and thinking what crayons they're not using, look at the ones that they are using. Look at the ones that they've got talent with and then build those crayons and use those crayons to build some of the other crayons. My uh, brother Gary now reads extremely well and he reads deeply. I might read 15 books, but Gary will read the book 15 times. And he'll read it with such depth of learning that is absolutely amazing. And he used his other crayons to be able to develop his crayons over a period of time for reading and writing. So linked to this, the two-handed alphabet of Australian sign language. We use a two-handed, America uses a one-handed, we believe they use a one-hand alphabet so that they can drink and sign at the same time. So Australians probably should have invented it. But the two-hand alphabet, you would know this, but if you put a V shape onto your palm, there's the letter V. Now, of course, your five, you're on your hand, you've got your vowels, A-E-I-O-U. A-E-I-O-U, the traditional joke is that it is a vowel movement. And you need to have at least one vowel movement every day. A, E, I, O, U. We're going to look at the U. So we've got V, U, the little thing. V, U, C. C is easy for Catherine. Beautiful word, C. So we've got the V, U, C. And then we know our vowels. So this is A. So what have we got? VUCA. VUCA. Now, VUCA, I didn't invent VUCA, um, but in 1989, I received a Sir Winston Churchill Study Fellowship and I got to go over and work with neuroscience people, people like Dr. Marion Diamond, one of the first neuro women, Candace Perth, uh, Thomas Armstrong, incredible minds, and got to look at how what we were learning about this brain of ours and, and what it might do for us. You know, we, we think 
1969, the big thing was the, the moon landing. Even bigger than that was in 1969, the Society of Neuroscience was formed. So it's a fairly new science about this incredible magic brain of ours. So in 89, I start doing uh, this incredible brain learning. And at the same time, the Berlin Wall fell down, the tanks were in Tiananmen Square, there was Exxon Valdez had an oil spill, big year, 1989. And because the Berlin Wall came down, the folk in the military decided that they should create a new word. And the new word that they created was indeed VUCA. And VUCA stands for four particular words. Now, some of you would know this. If you don't, try guessing. The Berlin Wall falls down, the world changes, and VUCA gets invented. And a V stands for one word, U a second word, C for a third word, A for a fourth word, and for in every presentation. But uh, VUCA stands for volatile. So volatility, U, uncertainty. C, complexity. A, ambiguity. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And this was 1989. You think of the last few months of our lives, how much of it has been VUCA. You know, I was presenting about VUCA the day that the world sort of shifted and changed. I had 200 principles, secondary principles from Victoria in front of me. And I'm running through VUCA, and as we're doing so, the message just comes through, all, all international trips and excursions cancelled. Um, the only countries they're letting you do a, a trip to at that stage were New Zealand. Right? And then uh, all, everything started to shift and change. And this VUCA world really started to, to hit home. It was volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. But co pre-COVID, pre-COVID and COVID videos, this world that we live in, we had VUCA. You know, the amount of anxiety that we were seeing in 10, 11 and 12 year olds in primary schools and the beginning of secondary school. Um, kids, kids being anxious about so, what they look like, what their friends look like, their life not as good as what it was, the social media impact, all of this stuff. They were living and dealing with VUCA before VUCA really even took paramount uh, uh, sage and became the number one thing in terms of this world that we're living in now. So I think some of the things that we all teach are even more vital because of VUCA and because of COVID VUCA. And this is one of the most vital of them all. Fingers ready, please. Think, fingers and thumbs almost touching, but not quite. See if you can keep up with me, it goes. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> now, this is a Japanese word that's been around for centuries, and you would know it. Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N. There wasn't any signing in the Auslan dictionary for Kaizen. So Carol Chittlebar and I came up with this. Fingers ready, join with me again. It goes, Kaizen is a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of improvement every day. And you celebrate those tiny little improvements. So you're not waiting to the grand final to celebrate. You're not waiting for the project that you've been working on for 18 months to celebrate. You're celebrating the tiny little things along the way that will help you get to the grand final, that will help you win. Now, Lindy and I have just had two weeks in uh, quarantine. So we lived in a hotel room and weren't allowed to leave that hotel room for two weeks. Um, and the interesting thing is we were finding little things to celebrate. Um, somebody would call us and tell us something or the tradies would get in touch and tell us the renovation they'd been doing here. There would be some progress that we could look at every day. Now, if we wanted to look at the list of misery in our life, 
we could go, oh, this is miserable, this is miserable. There's a bucket load of misery. But it seemed to be a lot better to be able to go, these are the little things. And when you and notice how it goes. It struggles at first, but then it kicks in. Progress. It struggles at first, and then it kicks in. So working with really talented sports people, young sports people, Australian Institute of Sport type sports people, and they want to be, some of them, instantly great. Now, I'd say, listen, we can be instantly good. If you're fortunate and you're born with certain crayons, you can be instantly good. Um, but nobody gets to be instantly great. Great takes a lot of this. And it, in fact, takes one of my favourite words in sign language. If you take your two hands and then rub your hands together, now, we in the hearing speaking world, we might go, ooh, here's an opportunity. How much money can I make out of this? But in the deaf community, this means let's get stuck in. Got a bit of a challenge here. Let's get stuck in. Ooh, this looks as if it could be tough. Let's get stuck in and give it a go. And I love that attitude. Kaizen is very much a get stuck in, give it a go kind of an attitude. And you may not be brilliant immediately, but little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit, you'll train your husband, your new husband, to be able to bring you drinks of coffee as you're watching a screen, little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit, and then it kicks in. And it just becomes how you do stuff. Yeah, uh, but celebrating those tiny little things along the way. Being able to say to your tradie, listen, love what you did on that particular part of the job. That's just magic. That makes so much difference. That's given us great heart. And then, of course, they want to be able to do the next thing really well too. So join me again. Kaizen is a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of improvement. Progress. Let's make each day a progress day and celebrate. Now, if we were to have a look at uh, the Japanese word of, uh, it, it's quite interesting because I presented this for years and I was presenting in China and they say to me, a uh, Japanese word, but originally from Chinese symbols. So the symbols to look at in terms of the Kai symbol represents change or correct and the Zen symbol is gently and gracefully. I love this. It's a philosophy of living your life in a gentle, graceful way, looking for the next change or correction, the tiny little improvement and celebrating it as we go. It's a philosophy uh, of looking and noticing. Wow, I love what you've done in that first paragraph of that essay. Oh, I love what you're doing there. Listen, I'd like to acknowledge the way you've done such and such. Being out in every workplace, if you can look for the tiny little things that everyone, Simone, Alison, any, everyone does well and acknowledge them, we, we take great heart in this. And I think it's actually a, a skill to learn and a gift to have to be able to notice the Kaizens and to be able to love them and work forward with it. So the interesting thing, of course, in sharing this with youngsters is as much as I, I love the Kaizen and I think the sign language works, if you can find a variety of ways to teach a message, a variety of ways to teach a message. We, we were working with one of, the, one of the families in our youth program and the parents at the parent night said to me, I keep telling my kids over and over and over again and they just don't get it. They don't seem to hear me. And I said, well, stop telling them. I mean, only a percentage of people learn by being told so, or tell and then do something else. Be more creative. Say to them, how many times have I told you? This is what I want you to do. Clean your room. Get down. Yeah. And I had a bit of a laugh. And I said, you only need to do that once. And I don't believe in shaming, but you do that to your teenagers once. And then you say to them, if you don't clean your room, I'm going to do that in front of your friends. Works a treat every single time. So Kaizen, beautiful in sign language, but I thought it needs a song. So I went to a great deal of anguish and trouble and time to write what I think is an original tune. And I say to kids, I want you to pretend that you're little kids. 
So I'll say it to six-year-olds and they'll pretend that they're two. You know, you say it to 16 and they'll pretend that they're six. So, and you haven't got any front teeth. And the song, I'll demonstrate it with my uh, deafness in upper, leg, um, uh, upper levels. My voice, my singing voice to me sounds magnificent. Not true for other human beings. But here we go. One, two, three. Kaizen is a little bit, little bit, little bit. Kaizen is a little bit improving every day. Yay! So let's try it all together. One, two, three. Kaizen is a little bit, little bit, little bit. Kaizen is a little bit improving every day. Yay! Again, I did have a, a colleague say to me, you're not going to do that with, with our people. They're all, you know, they're all older than 45, they're 45 to 60. And I said, mm -hmm. and they said, well, you know, and uh, you know, they're 80% um, male. And I'm not quite sure what 80% male is, but I said, okay, radio. And he said, you know, they, well, they're not gonna do any silly stuff. So I sang their song to them and I got them all to stand up. They're all from ex-military, most of them. They're in the police force and a variety of things. And they sing the song. A week later, I get a phone call. I pick up the phone, Glenn Capelli here, and his voice says, Capelli. I said, uh, yes. He said, oh, I was at that conference you did for the police people uh, a week ago. I said, uh, yes, mate. He said, that, that bloody stupid song. I said, yes. He said, I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> yes. You know, it's a neural pathway. It travels in there a little bit. So we get kids. Marimbula school, for example, the five-year-olds start every day with the Kaizen song. Then they do, let's get stuck in. And then they reach out for teamwork. They form the concentric circles of teamwork with each other. And at the end of the day, they sit down again in a Kaizen circle and share their Kaizens. They have a koosh ball and they'll say, my Kaizen today is I've got that great big spelling word correct. And everyone celebrates. <laughs> Throw the koosh. My Kaizen today is I only got into trouble four times. <laughs> Which for some people is magic. When I was a kid in Kalgoorlie, if I spelt a word incorrectly, the teacher used to mark it wrong with a big red cross. The Kaizen approach is to count the letters that are correct and to tick each one. And if the youngster gets three letters correct out of eight, and then the next day they get seven letters correct out of eight, well, how good's that? But if you're just marking it wrong, it's still just wrong. Little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. Now, I've taught Kaizen for, for decades and decades sports people, business people, youngsters, more importantly, apply it to our own life. Lindy and I apply it to our marriage, our relationship. We apply it to the, the building and renovation of a house. But I also recognise that it's not enough. Uh, we, I discovered that as beautiful as Kaizen is, as wonderful as it is in the years of teaching it, that it was only a philosophy of life and it needed to be backed up. Yes, be graceful. Yes, be looking gently for the, the improvements, but we also need some wide zen. Now, you may not be familiar with this word because I made it up, but if Kaizen is how better, wide zen is how else. So hands ready, please. Kaizen moves upwards, Wide Zen moves sideways. How else? How else? What's a different crayon I can use? We all get trapped in our strengths. We, the presenters listening to this and, and engaging, we will present in a certain way that are our strengths or we have a certain strength. So we use that all the time. And sometimes we're Kaizening something, but it's not the best thing to Kaizen. So uh, an organisation will improve a system, but this system may not be the best system in the first place. So it's a double helix. How better, how else, how better, how else, how better, how else. And that's a mantra. And I'd, I'd like you to join with me in singing it out loud. How better, how else, how better, how else, how better, how else. And every time, how better, how else. And even when you're doing something really well, what's another way that I could do this? Constraint breeds creativity. Every time you feel constrained by something, oh, this is an opportunity. How else could we do this? What's another approach to this? 
and any of you who have ever renovated a home from thousands of kilometres away <laughs> would know that you really need that how else uh, through all that we do. So the beauty of how better, how else, how better, how else, I give you now this. We asked in our youth program for all of our youngsters to come up with seven words that they would use to define intelligence. Nicholas was aged seven, and these are his words. It is his vocabulary. His dad was one of the owners of the Hawker's Hut in Oxford Street in Leederville, and a wonderful restaurant, no longer there, beautiful place. But Nicholas, notice what he did. He didn't come up with seven words. He came up with more than seven. And then he went back and fine tuned the list. So Linus Pauling, the only person to win two individual Nobel prizes in completely different fields, says to get a, a good idea, come up with many, and then go back and prune. So Al Marie, this is very much a, a, a Mensa plus at a how else. You know, <laughs> Nicholas had a very Mensa type mind, a very high IQ, but a creativity as well that went with it all. And I love, look, highly responsible. Is that not the best definition of intelligence you could have? To be different, to be open-minded, to celebrate differences. It's just beautiful. But let me give you some other words. Now, what I need you to do with these words is to choose three minimum, four maximum, that would be your favourites from the list. And if you've got a pen and paper, you can jot your choices down. If you haven't, then store them in your mind. If you've got any difficulty reading that, I'll read them out. Judge utilize, invent, suppose, compare, use, evaluate, imagine, solve, discover, analyze, do, apply. Now, they may be your favorites because what you think you're good at, they may be your favorites because you, you just like, like the word. However you define favorite is up to you. Three minimum, four maximum. Now, I'm not so much interested with people when they, uh, what choices they make. What I'm more interested in is unearthing from them why they've made the choice. So what you choose is one thing, but why you choose it, and that XI, oh, this is my favorite because. It's how people define the because that becomes really, really interesting. So 1993, several years after my Churchill Fellowship, I get to go to the very, very, snowy Minneapolis presenting at a conference and presenting the night before me and then the next day as well was Bob Sternberg. Robert Sternberg is a researcher in psychology. He came up with the triarchic theory of intelligence and he believes that intelligence is successful intelligence, beyond IQ, successful intelligence. And it came out to a CAP. Now my name being Capelli and all my mates for years have called me Cap, I happened to, uh, of course, I was going to love Bob Sternberg's uh, model. So the CAP model says there are three forms of intelligence. The C stands for creative intelligence, creative smarts. Uh, lemons had always, apples had always fallen from trees, but somebody saw it in a different way. To see things in a different way, to see things creatively. The A stands for analytical smarts, the ability to analyze, think deeply, put things into sequence. Um, my brother had difficulty with sequencing um, when it was a written word, but not difficulty in sequencing numbers. Brilliant with numbers, brilliant with analytical intelligence. The P never ever measured in an IQ test, practical intelligence. You know, the, uh, when the people were delivering our cartons shipped across and freighted across from Australia, their practical intelligence of being able to manoeuvre big things through into different doorway spaces and into rooms. Creative, analytical and practical. Successful intelligence. I, I, I love the model. I did say to Bob, I think you need to add something else. But beforehand, let's look at that practical smarts. My, one of my favourite newspaper articles, Flame Gets Joker in the End. A man who tried to extinguish the Arc de Triomphe eternal flame in Paris by sitting on it has been treated in hospital for burns to his bottom. Now, some people just don't have practical smarts. But check this out. Later in the article, in 1997, an Australian was arrested for using the flame to cook an egg. 
Now, he shouldn't have been arrested. He should have been celebrated. That's practical intelligence. You have a flame, you have a barbecue, you know? So practical smarts. Look at your youngsters. Um, where's their creativity coming alive? How do they use their analytical skills? Who's got the practical smarts? Um, when they're out natural play, best way to look at that, and kids don't do enough natural play now. Building a cubby, practical intelligence at work. So the words that you choose came from these fields. So the A's are analytical, the P's are practical, and the C's are creative. So analyze is analytical, imagine, creative. So go, go back to your chosen words and notice what your combination is. Did they all come from one field? Did you have a mixture of fields? Just notice. So I would ask an audience, and it might be hundreds, of, um, how many of you had all of your words from one field? And there will be people in the room who do. And I'll say, okay, what was your field? And somebody will say, oh, they're all analytical. Simone, did you have them all from one field? What, what was the field? The C, creative, beautiful. So practical as well. You went straight into sign language. And I could say they're beautiful. So yeah, creative. So I say, all creative, fantastic. Uh, what did you have? Oh, all analytical, magic, you've got to get together. <laughs> you've got to join up together, you know. But then I'll say, did anyone have a lot of practical? And there'll be very few, but they will. And I'll say, guess who gets to do all the work at your place? And they do. We, we need the practical people. Okay? They might not be able to come up with an idea, but boy, can they execute the idea. Uh, they carry it through in a practical way. So we believe in uh, this complex world of ours this, that we need this combination. We need group smarts. To all the tradies working at uh, Hardy Street here in Denmark, uh, Lindy said you, you, you're the tradie uh, uh, trend, you're the tradie group, you're the team. You know, you're Hardy's team here. And then they started to work with each other or at least appreciate that we're all part, rather than just doing their job, and not noticing what anyone else had done. Building a house, teamwork. Renovating a house, teamwork. Getting married, teamwork. Yeah, uh, everything about. So, so I said to Bob over a meal at night, mate, I love your cap. We need to turn it into a cape. Add the letter E and you've got the emotional intelligence, the stuff that Daniel Goleman popularised, about how, how good are we at communicating? How good are we at listening? How good are we at, um, at feeling uh, and having empathy of another human being? The beauty of the tradies, that, uh, and so Simone and the rest of the Denmark crew, here's thumbs up to all of them here, because they may have been great at plumbing. They may have been great at electric. They may have been great at handling a paint, paintbrush. But if you can be great at doing the painting and be a good communicator, a good listener, keep in touch, do all the emotional intelligence stuff. Know that it might be really tricky for you being a few thousand kilometres away and communicating and appreciating and having empathy of that. Brilliant. So no matter what skills your youngsters have got, if they can work and develop over time some of these em emotional skills, feeling skills, empathy skills, um, for me, it's just an absolute beautiful thing to be able to do. So we have this cap and this cape to be able to help us with VUCA. What also might be able to help us with VUCA, in a volatile situation, if you've only got one trading partner, probably dangerous. If you've only got uh, one person that uh, is supplying all your, your, your food stuff or one person that's buying all your produce at Walmart in America, probably dangerous. Variety is the magic key. Having a variety of friendships, a variety of types of human beings that we mix with. Variety is the magic key. The magic key is variety. Came up with that one with Ros Rosella Wallace, a wonderful Alaskan educator. And uh, Rosella, that's my favourite Alaskan wisdom. My second favourite is don't eat yellow snow, which you've got to think about. But anyway, so have variety in life. And with the uncertainty, Re keep rechecking your values. What is it that you, your mob's on about? 
What is it that the Denmark Shire is on about? What is it that you are on about uh, as a human being? And your values need to be exhibited, not just spoken about. Plenty of people speak about stuff on stage, but don't exhibit it in life. You know, to go back, what's the values? Uh, and part of that value, you know, to be someone to get stuck in, give things a go, looks for being able to think how better, thinks how else. And in a complex world, the vision. Now, a little bit more sign language as we move to wrapping this. Um, the one for this one. So, the begin, so if you can do sort of your fingers and, and it's like the number one in front of you. You, you. So that's first or start or begin. And then your point with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey from his Habits of Seven, seven Highly Effective People Habits. Um, begin with the end in mind. So... For all the struggle of renovating your house, you're keeping the vision of what you think it's going to look like, what you're aiming at, how good it's going to be. So for all two weeks trapped in a hotel room and, gee, pity the poor people that didn't have a balcony and couldn't open a window. You know, um, two weeks like that, you've got to keep the end in mind. I will be free. We will get through this. We will be healthy. This is worthwhile. Sometimes it's that bigger vision that just keeps you going. Variety, values, vision. And being able to think on your feet, versatility. You know, for all of us in the speaking, teaching world, you know, in comes COVID and suddenly it's like, oh, no more working on stage. What are we going to do? Yeah, you know, my brother and, uh, and Leanne running the lake house here in, in Denmark. Um, you know, you lose all your people. So what's your online business look like? How are you going to work with that? What are you going to do about it? Having some versatility, variety, values, vision and versatility overcoming the VUCA world, and we can do it through the absolute magic of this incredible brain of ours. So as difficult as it is, as challenging as it is in life, that I think there's some things in sign language that can help us. Let's try them, please. We get stuck in. And we look for the tiny little, little, little bits, and we celebrate them every day. And we do the how else. Because our crayons, now imagine a big thick crayon. That's the sign language of crayon, but it's very similar to flow. And flow is when we're at our very best. So whenever we're challenged, we can actually find a way to be at our very best, get stuck in, look for tiny little improvements, do the how else, wear our cap and turn it into a cape. Thank you very, very much for playing. Beautiful. So Simone, or you can unmute people if you like, or they can unmute themselves. And um, if anyone wants to tell me off or ask a question, or have a comment, that'll be magic. Thanks, Glenn. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. Is there any questions for Glenn? Um, that was just mind blowing. My mind's Blown, I guess that's that one. Yeah, so you're not you're a natural sign language person, Simone. Have, have oh. do you do you know Auslan or signing? Um, it's something that's on my to do list. I do actually want to learn um, sign language. I did start in primary school up in Newman. We started it before I left, and then came down here. And yeah, I do. It's you, something you, I do actually. You're want. a natural. You show things. You display it. You use the physicality. Um, so that's just beautiful. Yeah. You're signing without even knowing you're signing. That's... I also talk a lot with my hands too, so that probably doesn't. That probably helps oh, listen, I, my, I told this joke in, in, in. I believe that Indians and Italians are from the same genetic pool. Uh, and the joke, old joke, you would know this joke, goes walking down the street with two watermelons under his arm. He's got two watermelons. A bloke comes up to him and says, uh, Excuse me, mate, but um, could you tell me where the fruit market is? And the guy goes, Put this watermelon down. Puts this watermelon down and says, I don't know where the fruit market is. <laughs> <laughs> so whether we're Indian or Italian, we cannot speak without using our hands. <laughs> Was there any other questions for Glenn? It was just, um, just Glenn. Thank you so much. A quick Thank request, you, Glenn, please give my love to your brother. He was a club president in SWAP many years ago and um, when I was national president. So please give Gary my love.
Uh, indeed, I will. Now, you, not only would you know Gary, but the other Gary, Gary Pillane, who was a, a, another president of SWAP. Very well. And when Ian Stevens got his Nevin Award, um, he was talking about the Nevin Award and we had a photo of it. It was me and Ian and him with the Nevin. And Gary saw this photo and he said, um, that Nevin Award, is that uh, John Nevin? John Nevin? And I said, yeah, John Nevin. And he said, oh, he was a hero for me because he started SWAP. Mm. Yeah, I'm alive, I'm well, and I feel yeah. great. I got yeah. the kids at Wanneroo Senior High School to teamwork with the people at uh, Swan Swap. So we had business people in suits and my kids were ooh, black t-shirt at the best. Um, and they each were prejudiced against each other. We brought them together and magic absolutely happened. So recently on Facebook, one of these kids, now he's now 50 years of age, but one of these kids, he said, uh, uh, Mr. C, I still remember I'm alive, I'm well, and I feel great. The guy going along to one of those swap meetings, so John Nevin, no longer with us, but the seeds that he planted mm. by mm. doing swap, by doing um, uh, professional speaking, and I'm alive, I'm well, and I feel great. He knew this stuff. He knew we learnt physically. Mm. We learnt by chanting. We learnt in so many ways. So You did. Good on you, Catherine. I will pass on that to Gary. Please. There's an orphanage in Laos that gets up every day and says, I'm alive, I'm well, and I feel great. And um, Gary Pillane was president of Swan Swap, winner of Swap Worthy, and encouraged me to form some ambition around leadership. Beautiful. Small seeds are sown. It's great. Thank you so much, Denmark, for uh, hosting us. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We, uh, when the border opens, we, we in Denmark. Now look forward to you coming and visiting. And uh, the mm, guest right. room here is, is open. That sounds yeah. fabulous. And running some sessions maybe, hey, Claudia? <laughs> yeah, thanks, yeah, Glenn. Listen, yeah. They, would, they would love to do some sessions for you, Simone. Absolutely. We would. Yeah. We would. I would. I'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Team, bye. well I've, done. I've got to go and get started. Thanks, yes. Glenn. Yes. All right. <laughs> bye. Catch you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks, Glenn. That was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, good team there. A good crew, aren't they? Hello, Desmond. Thank you for being here, mate. I was here. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Desmond. Thank you, Glenn. Bye. Thank you. It was a good session, Glenn. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See some of you on the street. Yep. <laughs> good day. Uh, Bye. Just one quick thing before you go, um, Glenn. You're not interested in running another one, maybe? Oh, yeah. I, I got far too much material. Bye. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, yeah, because uh, Petra was asking me, um, that's my manager, uh, when um, you guys get settled, come in and see us and meet Petra. Yeah. Um, because we love having these sorts of things on and working with people doing this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it'll be um, you're great for you guys to meet as well. Um, yeah, and she was just wondering if, we, if maybe you could do another one in about a week, a week or two's time, but I'll, I'll have a chat with Petra first. Yeah, yeah. That'd, that'd be great. Probably a couple of weeks would be excellent, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, and and you know, later when we're able to get groups of people back out and being together, it'd be lovely to do some sort of a community thing. It, um, yeah. That's where all this stuff really comes to, to life. So good yeah. on you. All right, thank yeah. you so much. We're taking delight in being here. Oh, great. We're delighted to have you. <laughs> good on you. You take it easy and, and um, yeah, stay safe and enjoy the renovations and everything. Magic. Yeah. And of course, whenever I bump into you, I'm going to ask you, or you know, show me all the sign language you remember. So it'll be and a I'll test go, for both of you. See? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anya. All right. Thanks, Glenn. You take it Bye. easy. Glenn.